Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our so-called Hockey Hotline podcast. Uh, I'm here at episode four. We have a very special guest for everybody, all our, our viewers and customers out there today. We have um, Craig Johnson, um, former, former NHL player with the St. Louis Blues, LA Kings, Anaheim Ducks, Toronto Maple Leafs, Washington Capitals, um, and now uh, director of coaches for our Anaheim Junior Ducks. So, Craig, uh, welcome to the podcast, and thanks for uh, joining us. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Thanks for having me. For, first things first, I have ne- I've known you for a, uh, a while. You've actually coached me in, um, when I was playing and um, have been a big help with me uh, growing as a coach. But one thing I've never, ever asked you, what was it like when you got the news that you were traded for Wayne Gretzky? <laughs> I, was, uh, I was actually – it was kind of later at night. It was around 9 30, 10 o'clock in St. Louis. I was in my um, my apartment, and I, I can't remember if we had a game or a practice the next day. I get a telephone call from Mike Keenan. So you never know when you get a telephone from Mike Keenan what it's going to be. Are you traded? Are you being sent to the minors? Come down to the rink. So I, I um, you know, I just listened, and he, he said, uh, we, We've made a trade, and uh, he you know, he thanked me for everything. And then he said, I'm going to LA. So then I started to put, you know, there was some rumors going on before that. So um, that's, that's what happened. And the next morning, I basically, or actually it was that night, I basically packed up all my stuff. I put it in my truck, I parked my truck in a uh, parking lot. And I flew uh, with the suitcase to LA. And I was there, you know, from the from the trade until the end of the season. So that that was that was kind of where, where I found out, and you know I, I remember getting to LA and there was a big uh, news conference, and you know they were talking about it. it wasn't just myself; it was Patrice Tardif, Roman Volpat, and then some picks. And I remember someone asking me, you know, about filling Gretzky's shoes, or he was asking the group of us, and I. I go, if you put all our feet together, we couldn't feel, fill his shoes. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Now you all, you also had uh, the opportunity to play in the Olympics. Um, you got to talk about that experience. Um, you know, obviously this was before they took uh, NHL players, um, but what, what was that experience like? And, and where was that was 93 or 94? Yeah, it was 94. It was in Lillehammer and it, it was back before, there, there were pre- professionals in the Olympics, but they didn't uh, release NHL players. Okay. So, for for instance, Team Finland would have had players like Miko Makala, Slovakia had uh, Peter Stastny. So there were NHL players over veteran hockey players that were playing in those Olympics. But the U.S. team was kind of a mixture of college guys, guys that were uh, playing college, and then we had some pro guys as well. Um, guys that played in the minor leagues, like Peter Laviolette would be one you would know. Um, Derek Plant, um, di- different guys that um, that had uh, opportunities to leave their clubs, you know, whether it be in Europe or um, in the AHL to to play in the Olympics. So it was it was a great experience. We we were together the whole year. I think we we had camp in August. And we were in a place called Cromwell, Connecticut. Not much to do there, but we were there from August basically until the Olympics when we had to leave. We would travel at times um, to Europe. We had traveled. We did, we did a stretch around the U.S. and Canada where we played a Russian team and then the Canadian Olympic team. Um, we went to France. We went over to Norway um, once. We went played in the Izvestia Cup during Christmas in Moscow. So we had, uh, we had a really, really busy year. It was a great year. We were on the ice quite a bit. Um, we had Jack Blatherwick who would do our uh, skating and uh, I guess the conditioning part of it. So a lot of times we were on the ice twice a day. Um, playing in the Olympics was a dream come true. You know, growing up watching, I think I was eight years old when I watched um, the Miracle on Ice walks. I don't even know if you were born then. but <laughs> <laughs> I know I wasn't. <laughs> But in, uh, but you know, I was eight years old. I was watching the Olympics, and it was it was a dream, you know, that I always wanted to play for my country, and to get that opportunity was pretty neat. Um, the Olympics was, you know, from number one, the opening ceremony, walking in, and 
you know, with all the other athletes and seeing the athletes from different countries, seeing the atmosphere that, uh, that was in Lilyhammer at the time. Um, I, one of the, one of the kind of the neat moments I had, I was, we, we had like an athlete's uh, village and in the athlete's village, I was, uh, I was up at the area where you could grab uh, water or you could grab some food, like some power bars or whatever it was. And all of a sudden there's another guy in there and he's just kind of sitting and, you know, just, I think he's eating a snack or whatever. And I just started talking to him and I go, oh, you know, what are you? He goes, I'm a downhill skier. And I go, oh, that's awesome. I go, when do you, uh, when do you compete? He goes, oh, we just competed. And I go, oh, well, how'd you do? He goes, well, I won the gold. So <laughs> ended up, no, I was the, no big deal. Uh, yeah, I was, I was next to Tommy Moe. And Tommy Moe had won the, uh, you know, the Olympic gold medal. And he was just kind of decompressing. So I sat there and talked to him for about 25, 30 minutes. And we just talked about, you know, the Olympics coming up for me and where he was going with it. And it was, it was a pretty neat experience when I look back at it. And then, um, you know, the Olympics didn't go quite as well as um, we would have wanted. We lost in the crossover game to uh, Finland. And, you know, we were, we were young and naive and we, we thought we were pretty fast and good and that uh, we were, we were kind of young and cocky. And they, they had so many veteran players and they just, they possessed pucks and they kept pucks and they passed the puck so well. And, you know, they were just so smart. We were kind of chasing the game the whole time. So losing the crossover was a disappointment for us, um, you know, because going into the Olympics, we thought we had an opportunity to do really well. We, we had beat Canada, the, mo the majority of our games leading up to the Olympics. We tied them in the uh, preliminary round and, and we, we did have, we, we had a good team, but uh, I didn't think we were, uh, when the moments mattered the most, we just, we just didn't play the way we needed to. Oh, right on. Now, you, you, uh, you know, you're a University of Minnesota, you're a gopher. Now everyone knows your, your son, Ryan, is a, is a gopher as well. Um, how is that feeling, no, you know, seeing your, your son, you know, wearing the same uniform as you, you did in college? That must be pretty cool. Yeah, it really was when, you know, when he was going through the whole uh, recruiting process, it was, it was one of those things where I didn't want to get too involved with it. It had, it had to be his decision. So when Minnesota started calling and we visited and I, I kind of left every opportunity he had to, you know, to pick a school up to him. He asked little questions here or there, but I, I, I mostly let him decide when he, I, I thought I actually was going to go to Denver and, you know, at, at, I think it was almost the, the last hour he came back and goes, you know what, I want to, uh, I want to go to the University of Minnesota. So we, I was, I was really happy. Number one, I still have family there. Number two, it's like you said, it's, it's kind of neat to see, you know, like I, I grew up in St. Paul. I, you know, I went to school at uh, Hill Murray, which was uh, probably about, 15 miles from the University of Minnesota. My house was about four miles from the University of Minnesota. So all the way from youth hockey, all the way through my college hockey, Minnesota hockey, gopher hockey was kind of a kind of like something I watched every single year. And I would go to the games and, you know, to have the honor myself to play and then to watch my son, it was pretty neat. Hey, Craig, were you able to watch uh, Hill Murray win the state tournament this year a little bit? Yeah, yeah, I watched the uh, last game. So uh, a friend of mine, or two guys, two guys actually, they were twins, uh, Mark and Mike Strobel. Um, they were a year younger than I was, but we, we played together and we became good friends over the years. And uh, Mike's son, Charlie, he, uh, he had an awesome tournament. And yeah. they ended up winning it. And now yeah. Charlie's going to the University of Minnesota too. So. Oh, that's, that's cool. That's crazy. Do you think there's anything, like outside of – Minnesota high school hockey and the craziness behind it. Do you think there's anything that we see nowadays that's not a, on a professional level that even comes close to how popular and how big uh, Minnesota high school hockey is? Yeah, they, they talk about um, Indiana basketball, and I've never been to a game to watch any Indiana basketball, but I guess those sectionals in the state tournament are unbelievable. But that's what, that's what uh, Minnesota hockey is. 
they get over a hundred thousand people to attend all the games over the That's over crazy. the three days or four days now. But um, you know, you you look at uh, the NHL attendance on the night of the state tournament. And yeah. I think uh, the state high school hockey tournament had more people. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that's, that's, that's super cool. Would you think that it's also creating, a, a, you know, the community that Minnesota has brought together? When you go to some of those games and you, and you watch these young kids, they aspire to be those, those high school kids. You know, they I obviously make dreams of going to the NHL, but they even look at a, you know, a smaller term when they're really looking, you know, maybe I can play varsity hockey for that particular school. I mean, they really – build that community yeah i i think um it's it's as you said growing up i would i would get out of school early and i'd go watch the high school tournament and you know those those players that you were watching they were almost like legends to you yeah you know, because they would talk about them they'd be in the newspaper and and then uh you know for for me my goal wasn't to play college hockey my goal was to to play at hill murray and, and that's that's kind of the pathway of, of well, it's it's changed a little bit now because everything seems to change as we go. But more kids are going to junior hockey now. But but for us, playing those four years in high school were really important. And you know, number one, you get to you get to play for your school. Number number two, you're you're going for that goal of playing in the state tournament. So I, I was lucky enough. My um, I was able to make the tournament. We were. We ended up losing in the championship to uh, Edina. Yeah, man. Wow. So you played, and obviously, years back, I think you and Dino played in the back back in the Stone Age, right? Yeah. <laughs> so you know, growing up and obviously playing at the level you did, and the game of hockey has changed significantly. Um, you know, now compared to back then. What, what do you what do you think are, are some of the the biggest things that you see um, as someone that's kind of around the development side now um, and a player back then um, as the biggest kind of differences um, that you see with the game? Well, when you when you watch a game from the nineties, you know you're you're watching a lot of clutching and grabbing, hooking. You know you were you were given one hook before if you if you hooked them two times it might be a hooking penalty but you could you could yank them and you know grip them and hold and there was the can opener that you would have been really good at walks so yeah. it you. <laughs> <laughs> what stick, do you mean i would have <laughs> <laughs> the stick uh the stick went through the legs and then they they pulled and you'd end up down on the ice and it was never a penalty it's great so, one-on-one yeah taking one-on-ones and you go against guys and they'd have their sticks in your gut so that was that was an easier way too but you know I, I was lucky growing up because um there there was a guy I, I mentioned him earlier his name was Jack Blatherwick and Jack I, I had met him when I was 15 years old and Jack loved to watch the Soviets play hockey so everything was about puck possession everybody everything was about skating pass and using your brain all those things. So I, I would skate with him in the summer quite a bit. He ended up being an assistant coach at the University of Minnesota. And our style of play was a little bit, a uh, little bit different. We were a puck possession team back then. We would pass it back to the goalie. We would, uh, you know, if, if we didn't have things, we'd curl back up. They didn't want us to dump it in. So, so growing up that way, it was, I, I, it was good for me because I was able to make plays. And I, I think at the end of the day, it's pretty easy because I, you know, I ended up playing in the NHL for a while. But um, to dump the puck in is is pretty easy. But when you have <laughs> to, to make a play or to try to do some or to stick handle or create space or things like that, or just to think the game, I think you need the upbringing where, you know, I had it where, where we were taught to one tuck one touch passes we were taught to, taught to hold the passes we were taught to you know make the extra play and then also growing up and watching Wayne Gretzky doing all that stuff you know helped me too because we didn't have the uh, internet access that they do today obviously because there was no internet so my my hockey viewings when I was younger were I would stay up till 10 20 10 30 basically and at 10 24 the sports section would come on and I just begged for him to play the North Star Clips. <laughs> so and there was a, there was a show on when I was a kid. Don Sherry hosted a show too. So I'd always watch that 
every Saturday. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, in answering your question, I was lucky in how I grew up in that um, I had to pass the puck. I had to, you know, make plays and it, it helped me become a better player as I got older. Cool. So that, that being said, like, you, obviously the game has changed now. What are, if you had to pinpoint three, three things of focus that kids should be really working on and focused on right, right now in terms of development, um, what, what do you think those would be? Um, I, I would say num number one, I, I believe skating is really important. Um, I, I feel if you if you can't skate, you uh, it's really hard to play the game. So that that would be number one. I think the puck skills is is the other thing. You know, being able to make plays on your forehand, backhand, um, being able to protect the puck. You know, being able to pick pucks off the wall, little things like that. So puck skills would be two, and then I think just the hockey IQ, kind of like what I touched on earlier. You know, to be able to make plays under pressure, to see things, to see um, passing lanes, to uh, to be able to think the game a little faster. Those, so those were those would be the three areas. What's great to hear is, uh, you know, through some of our other podcasts, we talk about our grassroots and some of the other things that we do on uh, on the rinks level uh, and with great parks and the rinks. And uh, one thing that we could all agree on, it's great to hear you say the skating. You know, a lot of families want to part uh starting this journey of of hockey and uh through our intro programs we really want to emphasize the skating and the development on that end and sometimes they want to get down the road a little too quickly and we really want to pull them back and just reiterate the importance of skating 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 so it's really great for you to kind of put that out there as well yeah it's it's important i i feel I feel like, especially with younger kids, they just need to get reps and they have to understand, you know, why they're, they're doing something too. Like, are they, do they have the proper technique, the knee bend? Why can't they do it? And it's important to correct right away too, because I, I feel if, if you have young players, you don't correct them, their habits or their, their bad habits, I should say, carry on. And now all of a sudden, now you, now you, they get the peewee, they get to ban them and it's very hard to correct so it is important at the grassroots to uh, to really emphasize that in the proper way. Uh, yeah, no, I, I totally, totally agree. I think that's key, like you said, is in correcting opposed to waiting um, until it's too late. Um, you, know, you get kids that come into band, a PV band, and that have been doing the same things wrong for years and it's, it hasn't been corrected. I think it, it helps with their overall development and kind of speeds it up if it, they're correcting from day one. So totally agree with that. You know, outside of, um, you know, players working on things, skill development, uh, things that you just talked about, you know, obviously given the kind of climate we're at now where everybody's kind of stuck at home and, and kind of really trying to um, kind of create different ideas of how to continue their development at home, you know, what are, what are some of the things you, you think kids can be working on you know, right now as their home, whether it be in their living room, their backyard, their garage, uh, some kind of elements that they can really incorporate that are going to transition themselves when they get back on the ice to help with that development. Yeah, I, I think um, number one, having a little bit of time off, I don't think is going to hurt these kids at all. You know, the, especially the younger players, sometimes they, they get so stuck on the 12 month season and they it's they they feel like leaving the ice is gonna is gonna devastate their kid or they're gonna miss out. So I think right now no, number one is for for younger players just to go out you know and outside and be active, um, run around if you have a brother or sister just playing tag or going out and playing basketball and doing other things. But if you want to like specifically work on certain hockey things, I think I think number one um, you know the especially as the kids get older, the strength is very important. So for a young player, if they want to talk about like becoming a better skater, well, you have to get stronger and you have to get comfortable, you know, at that uh, lower, lower, uh, um, I guess, uh, setting. Yeah. So around 90 degrees or whatever it is. And now if they get comfortable in that area and, and there's little things they can do and part of it is being active, but maybe it's a little bit of strength and conditioning, maybe it's jumping, 
but anything where they're getting comfortable on that one leg. Um, the other thing is shooting. You know, everybody likes to shoot pucks. So, you know, there's, you go to Amazon and you, you uh, purchase one of those, those sheets, those shooting pads, and you can get them for like 90, hundred bucks. And you take those and you drop pucks out there. And if you, if you have a net, if you don't have a net, you can go to a park and you can uh, find a baseball backstop and tie a couple cans to it or whatever it is. And, and just work on shooting and accuracy and, and technique, you know, shooting off one leg, getting comfortable shooting off the other leg, um, push shots compared to uh, pull shots, you know, working on both those, those type of shots as well. Um, backhand shots as well. Then if, if they have rollerblades, rollerblades, you can still work on little things like edges or crossovers, or, you know, you could, you could skate uphill, skating uphill, I feel is really good for kids as well. So you keep busy doing those things. And like I said, I think going out and playing basketball or, um, you know, obviously you can't play tennis right now, but doing things like that are going to help you as a player too. Craig, I was, I was going to ask you something here. Oh, okay. you, brought up, you brought up taking a break. You know, when I grew up, and I'm sure when you grew up too, when hockey was over, hockey was over, correct? Yes. The other yeah. sports. What do you think about today's? And it's, all, it's not just hockey. It's all you sports. My son's a lacrosse player. That's all he did all year round. So I want to get your take on what you think about taking breaks, you know, from sports and playing a different sport, playing, you know, I, I know you coach travel hockey's. I coach Bantam double A or whatever. We go do dry land and have a kid throw a ball. He can't even throw a ball at, you know, if he, if, but he can shoot a puck. So what do you think about taking a break compared to back when we played compared to now when, when kids are playing now? Well, uh, hockey, hockey is such a, uh, I guess, specialized sport. So if you, if you work really hard at it at a young age, you can be really good as a squirt, as a peewee, as a Bantam. But when you go into, uh, you know, the higher levels, you need to be an athlete. And, and if you talk about playing other sports, let's just talk about lacrosse. There's so many, it's, it's an attack sport, right? So there, there's so many things you could take from a lacrosse game that could transfer over to a hockey game. The little give and goes, you know, finding time and space, um, protecting the, the ball or the puck are, are similar. Right. So, so the kids that just focus on one thing, hockey, especially with positioning, it, you, you almost rep something over and over again. So as, as a mite, let's say I play left wing my whole life as a squirt peewee. So I'm getting a lot of reps as a left winger. So all these, all these variables are coming at me almost the same. So I learned to deal with them. But when you're doing other sports, now you have different variables that are being thrown at you and you have to learn to use your brain or your skills or, and it, and it's, it's important too, just to like, I, I remember when I would finish a hockey season, I would, uh, I would start a running program and the first probably week or two I would, I would run. Uh, my legs were so sore because there were different muscles than what you were using as you skate. Okay. And it was kind yeah. of the same, you know, you talked about the breaks and I, I would take a break in uh, let's say March. I wouldn't get on the ice again until September sometimes. Right. So, so all of a sudden I'm back on the ice in September and all of a sudden my groins are sore. So, so you have to kind of balance. I, I feel like playing multiple sports is a good thing, but I also understand the importance of just keeping yourself sharp and in shape. So, you know, going on the ice once in a while, working on skills or things that you need to improve on are very important and should be, should be some, but playing basketball, playing lacrosse, playing tennis, playing you know, just just anything where they're they're a little bit outside their their typical box is important, and it and it makes for well-rounded kids. You know, I you look at some of the NHL hockey players, and yeah, there's there's the ones that are out there that just played one sport. But you know, I, I look at different guys that were you know quarterbacks in high school. They were uh, they were guys that maybe a receiver, maybe it was, maybe it was a guy that played basketball, and he quit he quit hockey for one year because basketball was so important and then he went back to it so so that that's what I mean by as they get up into older the older ages the athletic part of a player really starts to come out and then and then you'll see kids that are just focused on one thing they kind of stay the same right yeah Craig I got a question uh coming from Minnesota obviously hockey is just massive and huge out there when you came to California 
could you foresee how much it's grown or how much it could grow, especially like from back then to now? Yeah, it was, you know, you, you look at it when, you know, I'll go back to when Gretzky came in. I, I don't know the numbers, but there might have been 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 players somewhere in there. And all of a sudden the popularity starts to, starts to grow. And now all of a sudden you see kids, you know, there, it, was, it was talked about Wayne Gretzky would drive around and see kids at the uh, tennis court, you know, with rollerblades on and starting to play. And then, you know, obviously when the Ducks came, that was, that was important to Southern California and to, you know, especially the, specifically the Orange County area. And then having uh, the Ducks win the cup and then the Kings win in the cup and to see it grow to, to where it is now, where I never thought, I, would, I never would have thought there'd be high school hockey out here, you know, especially coming from Minnesota. But, but for me, I was lucky in that both my boys, one's 21 right now, one's 18. Both my, both my boys got to play for a high school team. They got to play with their friends. They got to go eat lunch with them, you know, during the school day, they got to go to dances with them, hang out with them. And it was, it was really neat for them to, to be able to experience that. So yeah, yeah that's, that's the part I, I wouldn't have foreseen that at all, that uh, we would have had this many high school teams and the level would be where it's at. Yeah, and it's pretty awesome, you know, you guys, you know, you're coaching SM or, um, and winning a couple of national championships helps kind of solidify hockey is a hot spot in California too, which is awesome to see. Yeah, not a, a couple, three, but. <laughs> but who's clear? Uh, three, who's three, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we did, we, you're right though, we did get two seconds, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, so there you go. <laughs> it's still so cool. uh, on that note, what, if you had to pick two memorable moments as a coach, well, one as a coach and one as a player, what would be, well, in your top two or so? Um, I, I guess making the NHL would be one, playing in my first game. Yeah. Um, playing in my 500th game was, uh, you know, those were memorable moments. Right. Um, all, the, all the teammates that I played with and were lucky enough to play with. Uh, the Olympics, obviously, and then then coaching. I would I would say um, it, it was it was kind of you know to watch watch the Santa Margarita team and and how um, you know no when we first went out to our first national championship, everybody would look at us and think, oh my God, it's a team from California. They must not be very good. <laughs> so our first year, I think we 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 did we didn't win many games. I think we were eliminated right away. The next time we did a little bit better. And then by the uh, the third one, a little, little I think freeze. we lost. We lost two. Uh -oh. The next uh -oh. year, we we beat that same team in the finals. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. There yeah. we go. Um, yeah, the com the computer got tired of hearing about Santa Margarita, so it paused you. <laughs> <laughs> it's it stopped when you said the third time we were going there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, so so we ended up. Um, you know, winning that national championship, it, it, it was, it, it's, it, it's a special moment. Anytime you can win and you see the kids that work so hard for something and then how excited they are too. So that, that was, that was a really, really neat moment for me. And just, and it's, it was more because I, I enjoyed watching the kids and you know, what they accomplished. That's, That's cool. awesome. Yeah, thanks. So we, we talked, kind of touched upon like some of the things for kids to be working on and uh, some of the skill development and kind of attributes to kind of be looking for the new age hockey. But I mean, right now, um, if you kind of switch gears to like the coaching side of it, you know, this, it's a downtime for coaches as well. You know, what are some things that you think or you recommend that um, coaches can be doing during this downtime to help improve their kind of knowledge, the coaching, like all that, like what are some of the things that they can take advantage of that you think at this time? Um, I, I think exactly what you said. If you're, if, if you can use this time to get better as a coach, I think, uh, I, I think you need to use this. So I, I guess the biggest thing is like why sometimes, like if you can study why things happen. Um, so if we're, if we're, we're talking about, um, let's say puck retrievals, you know, for a defenseman. So if you, if you can study and you can, if, if you can look at defensemen and how they go back, and this is something that, that coaches can help their defensemen. Number one, how are they skating? Are they pivoting well? 
when they go back is the four checker that's coming at you does he have a good angle or not is he is he right on you do you have a little time space can you escape can you make a play all those all those things um, can help a defense I mean, I mean a, a coach as they work with defensemen um, you know I, I always look at uh, how, how you can expand I guess as a coach you start watching video and I, I've been I've been going over a lot of overheads of different NHL games and, and these are these are not the, the typical you know view it's a, it's an overhead where you can see systems and you can see um, maybe habits that players have that other players don't so you watch the dry sidles you watch um, you watch the pan Panarins, you watch, you know, Malkin, Crosby, whoever it is, and you, and you look for tendencies that they might do, which can help your players too. Um, finding new drills, writing down new drills, you know, finding, you know, ways to get better is important. And then, and then going on, uh, maybe it's a Zoom call, maybe it's through USA Hockey, what they put out, maybe it's through um, something else, but, but pick pick up ideas from other people and then try to incorporate them in what you're doing. So. Cool. Yeah. I, I make no bones about it. I, I love to steal drills. I, I think I've stolen a whole book full from you over the years. So I don't, I don't, I don't know if I've ever gone and watched a practice and not stolen a drill or come to the realization that drill doesn't work. Like I'm always, there's always something in the game from anybody's practice, I believe. So, um, yeah, I was just interested to kind of, I know we're always talking about players right now in this time of how do the players get better? What are they, what can they do to, um, you know, keep developing? But I think it's also a key time for coaches as well. Downtime, it's, it allows opportunity that maybe, I don't want to say you didn't have in the, in the past, but I think it's a time right now that we can spend improving our knowledge of the game and kind of, our coaching style so yeah and, and most most of the time te you know coaches are teachers and they're also leaders so there's different books you can read to um, books that will help you maybe understanding the teenage brain a little bit yeah or maybe a book on leadership where you, you know you watch what john wooden did and you know you can you, you can definitely pick up ideas from different people but yeah you, you have to you have to be willing to get better and it's not just going out and looking at Instagram and going, okay, well, that's a cool drill. Let's do it. Yeah. So. I guess that goes back to the why you said, right? Why are you doing it? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I want to know where to get the book on the teenager one. <laughs> oh, I can read it right now. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I said it. There it is. What's it called? The teenage, teenage brain. brain. Oh, wow. I need that one for sure for my kids. There you go. <laughs> That's great. Whoever wrote that book must be a genius, right, Craig? Yeah, it was a teenager. <laughs> but, but going back to Walker's comment about the uh, drills, you know, Mike Babcock always said, you steal and then you rename them after yourself. And that's why everybody, I, uh, all of a sudden I'll see a drill and I'll go, oh, that's, that's a drill I kind of, you know, remember doing. And they go, no, Walker did that one. Yeah, <laughs> I rename them. The Walker one, the Walker two, the Walker three. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I, have no, I have no bones about stealing them and I tell people where I steal them from I mean the greatest thing was when the we had that NHL the youth uh, kind of showdown going on the rookie showcase going on there's tons of practices going on there's so many great drills that I I stole and I incorporated this year with my team and I thought they were you know, worked, worked great so um, but anyway I, we're at that kind of that time here I um, appreciate uh, Craig for coming on and sharing a little bit of knowledge and some stories with us and, uh, and our customers. And um, I hope uh, everybody got a little bit out of it, but I want to end on one, one question, just to have your brain work a little bit for us, kind of get your opinion or kind of thoughts on it. If you're going golfing tomorrow to force them, you and three other athletes dead or alive. Who'd, who'd you take? I've taken Michael Jordan because uh, I've been watching that documentary. So that's, that's my number one guy. I'm going to, <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably put Gretzky in on that one too. So you can kind of pick his brain and then I'd probably actually take my dad because he's 
done so much for me. So that would, that That's would cool. be my foursome right there. So, That's great. and, and I, would like a good foursome. Yeah. And I, I'd make sure my dad and I get a lot of strokes cause I know Jordan likes to gamble too. Yeah. So <laughs> I yeah. out some, yeah. some, yeah, finances now. Perfect. <laughs> well, again, I appreciate you coming on, taking uh, some time to sh share with us today. And uh, like I said, I hope everybody, everybody listening and watching to this, uh, you know, it's um, a little bit out of it. Um, so again, thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks, Greg. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for having me, guys. Stay thanks. safe and healthy. Take care. Yeah, thank you, you too. You too. Bye.